Well, good morning. I am, I shouldn't talk with my glasses in my mouth. My mother would kill me. <laughs> my mother was the queen of etiquette, and we would get blasted. If we talked with food in our mouth, if we talked with glasses in our mouth, fingers in our mouth, whatever. That has nothing at all to do with what I want to talk about today. <laughs> Uh, as Katie did, I want to welcome all of you, especially uh, those of you that are visiting to our seven-week Explore God series. You've seen the billboards, right? How can you miss them? And this is really an amazing Sunday, or actually I should say an amazing seven weeks, because today Wheaton Bible Church is joining with over 900 other churches throughout the Chicagoland area to explore what Christianity has to say about these seven most common, most fundamental questions uh, of life. And so today, we're going to begin with the naughty, somewhat complex question of, why did the Bears lose last Sunday? <laughs> but actually, I think it's a subject most of us wanna, don't want to think about, we don't want to talk about, so I've got another option. And today what we're going to do, and again, this is together, all the churches will be uh, doing these uh, week after week in a chronological order. Today we are looking at this question, does life have a purpose? And to answer that, I want to go back 3,000 years in time to a little bitty book in the Old Testament that is very unusual and highly philosophical. It's a book entitled Ecclesiastes. Now we don't know for sure what that title Ecclesiastes means. It's taken from the word teacher in verse 1. You'll see that in just a moment. So it could mean teacher as in a philosophy teacher. Or it could mean a philosophical seminar or a classroom. It, it could mean the content taught in, in that seminar. Or it could mean any form of any of those above. So as we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 this morning, I want you to kind of imagine a, a, a teacher, in this case it will be the king of Israel, Solomon, who has this uh, philosophy seminar of sorts uh, going, and he's walking us through a series of questions. We'll see one in chapter one addressing this issue of the meaning of life. Does life have a purpose? So if you haven't already, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter one. We'll put this these 11 verses on the screen, and I want you to stand with me as we read God's Word together, or as I read, I should say. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, that would be Solomon. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And when we say Ecclesiastes is a highly unusual book, it's because of this. Uh, you won't go to any of Paul's epistles in the New Testament, and Paul will begin, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And here we come, verse 3. What do people gain? Gain is the word profit from all their labors at which they toil under the sun. Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south, turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? 
It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. Now, let me just press pause. Solomon is not saying there will never be new construction. He's going to build the temple in Jerusalem. Solomon is not saying there won't be scientific, technological, cultural advances. What he is saying is that the human experience remains the same. Birth, life, work, suffering, and death. Nothing is new relative to that cycle. Now we conclude with verse 11. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who followed them. Now you may be seated, and you're probably all feeling really good about that. And what I want to do is I want to do three things this morning. Solomon raises a question here. I want to look at the question. Then he has a a, a rebuttal to three problematic views uh, people take in this area. And then he concludes by giving us a solution. So let's begin with the question. The question is stated here in verse 3. When he asked the question, what do people gain from all their labors of which they toil under the sun? Now, there's a bunch of interesting words and phrases here, and I want to mention just two. Two things that Solomon says that are important or helpful for our understanding. First of all, notice the phrase in the middle of the, uh, relatively near the middle of the sentence, um, from all their labors. Solomon is acknowledging something that we often miss. What he is saying is that humans have always been busy. Sometimes extraordinarily so. That's why the word is in, all is in there. From all their labors, as if they're nonstop. Now let's go to the end of the verse, to this phrase, which is the most important phrase in the Uh, in this verse, really in the book, under the sun. Now that is a technical phrase that means life apart from God. That there is no God above the sun. No heaven. All we have is nature and everything under the sun. Now, this becomes a little more clear when you look at verse 14. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun, and all of them, all of them are meaningless. They're chasing after the wind. There is no meaning, Solomon is asserting, because God does not exist. He's arguing the point. That God doesn't exist. All that exists is under the sun. And now he's going to weave out some of the implications as we travel. So what Solomon is doing in verse 3 is saying, yes, you're busy. Yes, you're doing all sorts of things. But when it's all said and done, what do you have to show for it? If God doesn't exist. How will your busyness in a meaningless world profit you? It's the word gain. Nothing you do, no matter how much you do, no matter how good it is, matters. There is no profit. Your stock market will crash. We are left to what's under the sun. Now, as I said, this book is 3,000 years old, but do you see how relevant it is. Do you see how modern this? This is Western civilization today. Every single elite university in the United States teaches that it's uneducated to believe that God exists. That it's uneducated to believe that there is life above uh, the sun. And every single one of the elite universities in our country call their students to work extraordinarily hard. And the question the philosopher king is asking in verse 3 is why? Why does that matter? What's the profit in that? Everything is ultimately meaningless. Life has no purpose. 
So verse 3 is the question this philosopher king raises in this seminar. Now what he is going to go on and do is cite three different problems with affirming life apart from God. So I want to move from the question to some of the problems he is addressing. And let's start with the first problem. And let me put it, let me state it in terms of rebuttal. So the teacher says that you here, you may be think you may think you're making a difference, but ultimately you're a vapor. You're a vapor. Now what he's doing here is speaking into the position of the humanist today. Uh, the humanist is what we heard in the video. It's the person that says, uh, my meaning is to make the world a better place. My meaning is to, is to do something good. It's what we all want said of us at our funerals, right? She made a difference. She made a difference in this way and, and, and this way. But Solomon says it can't happen. You can't make a difference. Look at verse 11. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Solomon is saying you're a vapor. I mean, how much do you even remember about your great-grandparents? let alone your great-great-grandparents. In the wonderful musical Les Mis, there's this haunting line. Will anyone remember me when I fall? Will anyone remember me at all? And Solomon in verse 11 is saying, no, no one remembers the former generations. You are a vapor, even the most famous among us. So when we ask the question, how can we avert global warming, environmental tragedy, global starvation, a global holocaust, The teacher responds by saying, you're kidding, right? You can't save civilization. Civilization, like uh, all all the planets, die. What you're asking is merely how can we rearrange the chairs on the Titanic? How can we slow our extinction? And the teacher is saying the real question you need to be asking is, does God exist? Is there life above the sun or not? Because if God doesn't exist, then nothing matters. There is no purpose, capital P, in life. You are but a drop in the ocean, a meaningless forgotten drop in the ocean, a a footprint in the sand that gets washed away. And and, uh, whether you're, and this is the awful conclusion of this, whether you're a murderer or a missionary, ultimately it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to remember. Whether you're the height of evil, the epitome of good, Psalm is pressing in verse 11, saying it doesn't, it doesn't matter. No one's uh, uh, going to remember. Uh, but here's the problem with this. Let's say a friend calls you and says, hey, I, I need your help for something. I need you to drive into the city and stand on the corner of Michigan Avenue and Randolph for three hours. And then there's silence on the phone. And what's the first question you ask? Why? It's a question of purpose. 
It's a question of what is the purpose? Uh, what, what is the profit? You're asking the question why. We ask the why question thousands of times relative to the little things. We ask the, the why question when tragedy hits. Why? Why did this happen to me? Why did this uh, tragedy, this loss, uh, this disappointment happen to me right now? Uh, but my question, Solomon's question is, why do we seek purpose if there is no ultimate purpose? And his point in the question in verse 3 is it's the epitome or the height of inconsistency to always be asking the why question in the little things or the why question in the painful things, but to never ask the why question about ultimate things. Do you see that? Does that make sense? And could it not be that the reason we constantly seek purpose, we can't live without purpose, that we're always asking the why questions, why stand on the corner? Could it not be the answer is because we have been created, created by a God of purpose in his purposeful image? And he has infused life with purpose and the world around us with purpose and our desire for purpose, your desire for purpose, points to the existence of God. Now, that's the first problem, the first rebuttal. And let me go on to the second. It's the humanist question. Uh, the second problem can be stated like this, and this is in the words of the teacher. Okay, you say God doesn't exist, but you think you can find meaning and pleasure. But pleasure won't sustain you unless you don't think. Now, this is the way I lived growing up until I came to Jesus Christ. This is why so many of us are today in our culture. It's the, it's the, or at least for me, it was the thinking, well, I don't really care if God exists. I mean, why does it matter? I just want to have a good time. And, and we see that throughout culture today. If the first rebuttal uh, uh, addresses the issues of the humanist, this is addressing the issues now of what we call the hedonist. The hedonist is a pleasure seeker. But Solomon is equal to this. And he says, no way. So look at what he says first in verse 8. All things are wearisome. More than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What Solomon is saying there is pleasure will not satisfy the ultimate longings of your heart. Note that. All the fun, all the craziness, all the wildness will not satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. That's why over and over, over the last 40 years, so many rock musicians' life have ended in tragedy. But let's go on. Look at chapter 2. Here he gets more specific in verses 10 and 11. Look at what uh, our teacher says. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. Now he can say this because he's the king and he has a world of money at his fingertip. And this was a reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Nothing is gained apart from God. The only way seeking pleasure will work is if you don't think about life. Hmm. 
if you stay intoxicated with pleasure. Because the moment you become sober, uh, you discover that pleasure seeking in a meaningless world may be fun, but it's a fraud. It's hollow, it's empty. Because God doesn't exist. I love how um, C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis is a famous, famous British author, put this once. Listen to his words. He says, you decide that life is about having as good a time as possible. You decide that the universe is a universe of nonsense. But since you are here, you will grab what you can. Unfortunately, you can't really be in love with a baby or a girl. If you know that all the beauties, both of her person and of her character, are a momentary and accidental pattern produced by the collision of atoms. And that your own response is equally meaningless. You can't get pleasure from music. We've just heard wonderful music. You can't get pleasure from it if you know that it's, an, its air of significance is a pure illusion and that you only like it because your nervous system is irrationally conditioned to like it. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> it's just the way it is, right? And he concludes by saying, you may still, in the lowest sense, have a good time but only if you ignore the hopeless disharmony between your meaningful emotions and the meaningless universe. You see, if God doesn't exist, you have no, it's impossible to explain why beauty exists and why you're attracted to it. If God doesn't exist, it's impossible to explain why you care for your family, why you love your family, uh, why you care so much about relationships. All you can do is not think about it. In contrast, Christianity unequivocally says, yes, God exists, and we who believe in Christ must use our minds. And if we are discouraged, if we are anxious, if we are angry, it's because we're not using our minds enough to think about how much God loves us. He loved us so much that Christ died for our sins and that the moment we believe in Christ, God adopts us into his family and that adoption is permanent and he forgives us and he loves us and he accepts us and he will never let us go. Pleasure seekers find peace by not thinking. Christians find peace by thinking more deeply about Christ. So pleasure only works if you don't think. And I, when I was younger, the reason it worked for me is I, I just wasn't thinking. Then there came a day when I... Uh, was in the middle of college, and all of a sudden I woke up and I realized i got to start thinking about some of this. Let me go on, the third problem. And here Solomon is rebutting again, and, and, and what he's saying in effect here is you may be courageous because you say you know God doesn't exist, but you will... Make up your own meaning and live a life of purpose in a purposeless world. So you may think you're very courageous about that. There is no purpose, but I will live a life of purpose. I will make my uh, own purpose. But the reality is you have no foundation for that whatsoever. You have a house and you have no foundation. Today we say the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose, right? You've heard that? The purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. But I want to say to you this morning, living a life of purpose in a purposeless world 
isn't a purpose, it's a narcotic. And so the, the first problem addresses the problem of the humanist. The second problem addresses the problem of the hedonist. Here, Solomon is moving to address the problem of the existentialist, if you will, the existentialist today who, who says, life is a leap of faith. I don't believe there's any purpose, but I'm going to make purpose, and that's a courageous act. And that's what the early existentialists uh, called it. But look at verse 17. We don't see this immediately, but let me read it and nuance it. Solomon writes, Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, and I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. Now what you need to understand here is wisdom is used differently in Ecclesiastes. Wisdom is learning apart from God. It's not giving yourself to knowing God. It's learning here. It's apart from God. And madness and folly are living apart from God. So learning apart from God and and, and living apart from God. And so what Solomon is saying here is this existential notion that there's no meaning that I can find meaning is madness. It's folly. Because the problem is you have no foundation. So let me tease this out for a couple minutes. If God doesn't exist, then you have no hope in tragedy. You will not get your loved ones back. If you are bullied at school, if you've just been fired from a job, if you've had a big blow up in your family or or years of rejection and hostility, if if, if you're lonely and you long for a meaningful relationship, You have no hope. You've just drawn the wrong card. Because everything is a chasing after the wind. Furthermore, if God doesn't exist, then you have no ability, we have no ability to define the concept of harm, evil, right or wrong. So today, you know what we say is, well, let society do that. Well, which society Nazi Germany? Syria? Iran? China? Furthermore, if God doesn't exist, then our deep longings for justice are groundless because ultimately there is no justice. You fight against starvation. He fights to starve people because of his bent toward domination. And yet in a meaningless world, we have no categories to assign morality. Uh, Years ago, I was in Switzerland at a kind of a think tank called Labrie, and I'll I'll never forget Francis Schaeffer, who was the leader of this kind of school of Uh, Christian philosophy said, and he said this in one of his books, he said, if I pour a boiling kettle of boiling water on your head, you may say to me, stop, it's going to hurt, but you cannot say to me it's wrong. Life is madness. It's folly. So do you, uh, the emperor has no clothes. The house has no foundation. You and I have no meaning. And people think, now hear me, people think Christians are crazy? Everybody is making a leap. Now, Let me begin to close this. Do you see what Solomon is doing? He is, if you will, he's attacking philosophically. 
He, he's pressing because he, he is showing us when it comes to answering the question, does life ha have purpose? Either God exists and there is purpose or God doesn't and there isn't. And there is no middle ground. And you have a choice. It's one or the other. And to say over here, there is no purpose, but uh, I will make my purpose as nonsensical and ultimately hollow. If both your origin and your destiny are insignificant, then have the guts to admit your life is insignificant. The one follows the other. So now, what's the solution? What is the solution that Solomon offers? Well, we're not going to turn to it, but at the end of ecclesial Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiology, um, at the end of this book, as we move into chapter 12, Solomon begins to say, remember God. Remember God. And the Hebrew word for remember doesn't merely mean engage your memory. It's a call to action. Remember the Alamo. And so what Solomon is saying when he says, remember God, is to align your life with and live for the living God. In the face of rampant skepticism and disdain for those who believe in the existence of God, an uppercase God. And so what is the solution? The solution Solomon offers when he says remember God is for us uh, to turn from ourselves and to turn to God and, and center our lives, not on ourselves, but on God. And when Solomon says remember God, he doesn't realize it, but he's pointing to Jesus Christ. And so not surprisingly, in the very first chapter of John chapter 1 and verse 14, John, the Apostle John, speaking of Jesus, says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here John calls Jesus the Word. The Word is a reference to Jesus. And the Word is a significant term because it's a Greek philosophical term, logos. And it means the reason, the purpose in life. The reason and the purpose in life became flesh and made his dwelling uh, among us. Uh, if, if your car is dirty and you crash it into your laundry room so that you can put your car in the washing machine, it's not going to work for you very well, right? Why? Because that's not the purpose of your washing machine. In calling Jesus the purpose, John is saying life is full of purpose. But it's not an abstract concept. It's a person. It, 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 it's Jesus Christ. The New Testament tells us fully God, he became fully man. Do you know this Jesus? Have you seen, it? as John says, his glory, uh, the glory of his humility, the glory of his gentleness, the glory of his compassion, the glory of his perfect life, uh, the glory of his healing, his miracles, his teaching, his suffering, his death, his resurrection. Have you seen the glory? Do you know Jesus? Do you understand that Jesus Christ, fully God, put himself into this world fully man in order to put us into the uh, put himself not just into our world but into our misery and into our life why 
so that he could bring us, the moment we believe in him, into his world, his joy, and his life. Jesus on the cross bore our sins. He bore our shame, our self-centeredness. So that when we believe in Jesus Christ, we can renounce that. And find forgiveness and righteousness and purpose. Now we are big Clemson football fans in our house. My son graduated from Clemson uh, just under two years ago. And God is doing some very interesting things on that now national championship football team. This year they won the national championship with a 19-year-old quarterback. And I want you to look at this video and see what he says about purpose. Um, I just, that's just kind of always been my personality. Um, and then just growing up, my family's always like, I mean, football's, football's important to me, obviously, but it's just, it's not my life. It's not, uh, it's not like the biggest thing in my life, I would say. Uh, well, my faith is. So that just comes from kind of knowing, um, knowing who I am outside of that. So I just know. No matter how big the situation is, it's not really going to define me. Just, just putting my identity in, you know, what, what Christ says, what, who th he thinks I am and who I know that he says I am. So really, like I said, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what people think about me or how good they think I play or whatever, you know, it doesn't really matter. So that's definitely been a big thing for me just uh, in my situation, just knowing that and having confidence in that. His name is Trevor Lawrence. He's deeply committed to Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter how big the stage, it doesn't matter how they destroyed Alabama. What, sorry, you Alabama fans. There's probably one of you in here. All the rest of us love Clemson. But man, this guy, as a 19-year-old, next year will be the best college athlete in football. It's clear that football isn't his purpose. Jesus Christ is his purpose. One spring day, I made that leap and gave my life to Jesus Christ. And he has filled my life with purpose. And I want to invite you right now to come to Jesus, to come to purpose to come to joy, to come to significance, to come to meaning. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that as we pray. Would you bow your heads with me now? If God has been speaking to you, and you are saying yes to Jesus, then in the quietness, just under your breath, pray with me like this. Father, you sent Jesus to die for my sins and to fill my life with purpose. I have been running, but now I want to come home and enter your family. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And now I give my life to you. Amen.